Hey, back for more. Heart of Darkness, we're getting near the end of this long, slow trudge through the jungle. Uh, so, I'm around about page 96 is when Marlo finally arrives at the interstation. Now, uh, when you think back to what he had been told by the aunt uh, about what they're going to be doing there, uh, improving things, right? And what he sees there is even more chaos than the previous two stations, right? Every station we move further inland, things get crazier and more chaotic and more violent and terrible. Um, so it said on page 96, a uh, long decaying building on the summit was half buried in the high grass. The large holes in the peaked roof gaped back black from afar and the jungle in the woods made in the background. There was no enclosure or fence of any kind, but there had been one apparently for now, uh, for near the house. Half a dozen slim posts remained in a row, roughly trimmed with the upper ends ornamented in round carved balls. The rails or whatever had been there had disappeared. All right now, we'll come back to those little ornamental things uh, on the uh, the balls on the uh, on the fence because it's much more messed up than that. Um, on page ninety seven, we meet a new dude, right? And this dude has spent a lot of time talking to Kurtz, right? Now, when you talk to Kurtz a lot or you listen to Mr. Kurtz talk to a lot, it does not do good things to your mental state. So this dude, it said he looked like a harlequin. His clothes had been made of some stuff that was brown holland probably, and it was covered with patches all over, with bright patches, blue, red, yellow, patches on the back, patches on the front, patches on the elbows and the knees, <clears throat> colored binding around his jacket, scarlet edging on the bottom of his trousers, and the sunshine made him look extremely gay and wonderfully neat withal, because you could see how beautifully all this patching had been done. Now, so... He dressed, uh, do you ever, do you know what like a, like a court jester looks like, right? Like brightly colored clothes and the little hat with the bells on it and that kind of thing. He doesn't have the hat with the bells, but he's dressed up like kind of like a clown, right? Now, he is not mentally well from spending a lot of time talking to Mr. Kurtz. Um, going on a little bit, go to page 100. So this is the very end of the chapter. Uh, it said, so he found, this is the guy who owned the book that Marlo found, right? The book about sailing from the last chapter. And Marlo thought that the notes were taken in cy cipher or secret code, but he just wrote it in Russian. Um, you made notes in Russian, I asked? He nodded. I thought they were written in cipher, I said. He laughed, then became serious. I had lots of trouble to keep these people off. He said, did they want to kill you? I asked. Oh, no, he cried and checked himself. Why did they attack us? Now, this is Marlo asking about the boat attack, right, when they were attacked in the fog. They don't want him to go. That's different, right? If the people who are attacking Marlo's boat want Mr. Kurtz to stay there, and that's why they're attacking this boat, that's very different. Don't they? I said curiously. He nodded a nod full of mystery and wisdom. I tell you, he cried, this man has enlarged my mind. He opened his arms wide, staring at me with his long, little blue eyes that were perfectly round. The man has enlarged my mind. Now, that's messed up and one of my favorite lines of the whole book. Um, if you remember the doctor Marlo saw before he left and he said, you know, he wanted to measure his head and he said, the changes take place on the inside. Now, inside and interior, I think interior was the word they used, interior as an interior station, right? That's where the mental changes are going to take place where Marlo is now, but also... Just the fact that all the things he's going through is changing him, right? Marlowe's attempt to not acknowledge what's going on in front of him leads to uh, mental challenges for himself, right? It doesn't do good things to his mental state. Now, going on, on page 104, 105, um, uh, 104, 105, um, he's talking about Mr. Kurtz, right? Uh, there's a lot of good cartridges left even yet, he answered, looking away. To speak plainly, he raided the country, I said. He nodded. Not alone, surely. Now, so we're getting some evidence that Mr. Kurtz, as highly thought of as he is within the company and in Europe, is just raiding the country, right? He's out to get as much ivory as he can get. Now, if you're writing a paper about why the book is anti-colonialism and uh, anti-racist, this would be a good one, right? For the most powerful, important person in the company to, it, they admitted he just came out there and is killing people and stealing stuff. Um, then he said he threatened to shoot the Russian guy. Shoot you, I cried. What for? He declared he'd shoot me unless I gave him the ivory and then cleared out of the country because he could do so. He had a fancy for it and there was nothing on earth to prevent him from killing whom he jolly well pleased. Now, civilized savage, two words that have come up in the book a lot. Uh, Kurtz is supposed to be the most civilized of all of them, right? And he is out here and he's 
raiding the country, and he is can kill anyone who wants to, and he can kind of just do whatever he wants. Now, this makes Europe look really bad if the most powerful, important person in the country is acting this way. All right? Going on, uh, on 106 and 107, we finally find out what the balls on the fence were about, and they are not balls. It said, bottom 106, um, now I had suddenly a knee review, and its first result was to make me throw my head back as, as if before a blow. Then I went carefully from post to post with my glass, and I saw my mistake. These round knobs were not ornamental, but symbolic. They were expressive and puzzling and striking and disturbing, food for thought and also for the vultures, if there had been any looking down from the sky. But at all these events, for such ants as were industrious enough to ascend the pole. They would have been more, even more impressive, those heads on the stakes, had their faces not been turned to the house. Now, this is another awesomely messed up detail. If you were walking down the street in your neighborhood and you see a fence around someone's house and there are human skulls lining the fence all facing out, that is a warning to you to stay out, right? If all of the skulls are facing in and looking at the person who owns the house, I'm not totally sure what that means. It could be a warning to Kurtz himself. Uh, it could be he liked it and he wanted to see these things for himself. This is another one of those inconclusive experiences that we kind of need to explain to ourselves. On page 107, it said, I'm not disclosing any trade secrets. In fact, the manager said afterward that Mr. Kurtz's methods had ruined the district. They only showed that Mr. Kurtz lacked restraint in the gratification of his various lusts, that there was something wanting in him, some small matter which, would, when the pressing need arose, could not be found under his magnificent eloquence. Um... On page 108 goes on, of himself, I can't say. I think the knowledge came to him at last, only at the very last. I think it had, the wilderness had whispered things to him about himself which he did not know, things which he had no conception till he took counsel in with his great solitude, and the whisper had proved irresistibly fascinating. It echoed loudly within him because he was hollow at the core. Remember the pop, paper mache Mesistopheles, the pa paper mache devil? We get this here again. Now, the admirer of Mr. Kurtz was a bit crestfallen. In hurried, indistinct voice, he began to assure me that he had not dared to take these symbols down, and these are the skulls on the fence post, not till Mr. Kurtz gave the word. His ascendancy was extraordinary. The camps of the people surrounded the place, and the chiefs came to see him every day. They would crawl. Now, the people who live in the neighboring villages, the Africans, apparently are worshipping Mr. Kurtz as some type of deity, right? Now, if you think back to what the company was supposed to be doing, this is not what the company is supposed to be doing. They would approach crawling, he said. And Marlowe said, uh, I don't want to know anything about the ceremonies used when approaching Mr. Kurtz, I shouted. Curious uh, that such details would be more intolerable than any heads drying on the stakes under Mr. Kurtz's window. After all, that had been only a savage sight. While I seemed at one bound to have been transported into some lightless region of subtle horrors where pure, uncomplicated savagery was a positive relief, being that it had a right to exist, obviously, in the sunshine. If it had come to crawling before Mr. Kurtz, he crawled as much as the various savages. Now, Marlowe, at this point, is kind of going over some of the things he's been called. The people from Africa have been called rebels, and they've been called workers, and they've been called criminals, and they've been called devils. Rebels? What would the next definition I was to hear? They'd been enemies and criminals and workers. These were the rebels. Those rebellious heads looked very subdued on the sticks. You don't know how such a life tries a man like Mr. Kurtz. Okay, going on. So... Russian dude loves Mr. Kurtz, not necessarily in a romantic way, but it's like almost a cult-like devotion to Mr. Kurtz. Um, and uh, page 111, we finally start to see Mr. Kurtz. Mr. Kurtz is not doing well physically. He's carried in on a stretcher. And Kurtz on page 111, Kurtz. Kurtz, that means short in German, doesn't it? Well, the name was as true as everything else in his life and death. He looked at least seven feet long. Now, everything about what Marlowe was told he was going to find is not true even down to Mr. Kurtz. Now, he gets to hear Mr. Kurtz talk a little bit, uh, but not too much. So go to page 113 now, please. Uh, now, we get the, the queen, and this woman appears to be having some type of relationship with Mr. Kurtz. Now, if you wanted to write the paper about royal women in the book, you're going to be focusing on the three women who are more broadly described. We got the aunt in the beginning. We have... The intended, Kurt's uh, woman he's supposed to get married to in Europe. And then we also have the queen, right? So if you want to write about these, you would be kind of lumping the aunt and the intended together. 
because they have very similar views on things, and then looking at the queen separately, right? Now, if you wanted to write this paper, what I would recommend doing is start by drawing a, you know, a little table, make a little chart, and some characteristics of them, right? The aunt and the intended are ignorant and relatively powerless. She helps Marlo get the job, but I would say that it's probably about the farthest her uh, strength extends. Um, yeah. Um, and then compare that to the queen here, right? You can look at the way she's described and dressed and who is in charge, right? This appears to be a matriarchal society that they're in. Now, if the Europeans view the people in Africa as savages, and that's why they're going to civilize them, but as we see, then the European people go over and they are the ones who act savage themselves. They act way worse than anyone else in the book, right? Showing that this binary opposition has been flipped. The European people are actually the savages. Now, to take it back to the, the world woman question, Basically, what he's saying here, whether he's intending to or not, is only in a savage society could a woman be in charge, right? And the proper role for a civilized woman would be to be like the aunt and the intended, right? So if you wanted to write this paper, since these women only appear in so many pages in the book, I would make sure to cover them really well, right? So, like, try to cover all the information because the aunt is only a couple pages in the very beginning. The queen is around this point, 113 to 125 or 20 or something, and then the intended shows up at the end. So just make sure you cover most of it. She was savage and superb, wild-eyed and magnificent. There was something ominous and stately in her deliberate presence. And she seems to be in charge of everybody. Okay? Now, on page 113... Um, oh, we just did that one. So we're going to go forward a little bit. Let me pause my... All right, going on to page 120, 121. The Russian guy leaves. He takes some cartridges and some pipe tobacco from Milo, and then he takes off in a canoe. Now, Marlo, at this point, it's nighttime, and he goes to look for Kurtz, and Kurtz is not there. And then he sees Kurtz crawling down a trail in the jungle in the middle of the night. As soon as I got on the bank, and I saw a trail, a broad trail through the grass. I, can't, I remember the exultation with which I said to myself, he can't walk. He's crawling on all fours. I've got him. The grass was wet with dew. I strode rapidly with clenched fist. I had some vague notion of falling upon him and giving him a drubbing. I don't know. I had some imbecile thoughts. The knitting old woman with the cat obtruded herself upon my memory as such an improper person to be sitting at the other end of this affair. Do you remember the fates, the woman doing the knitting, who saw Marlowe as he came into the doctor's office and then left? That's what he thought back to. Now, on 22-23, Marlowe is following Mr. Kurtz as Mr. Kurtz crawls through the jungle to this midnight ceremony. Now, on page 122, uh, the, it says... Um, we were within 30 yards of the nearest fire. A black figure stood up, strode on long black legs, waving long black arms across the glow. It had horns, antelope horns, I think, on its head. Some sorcerer, some witch man, no doubt. It looked fiend-like enough. It looks very devilish, right, with the horn standing in front of the fire. Now, for Kurtz, who is supposedly the most civilized person, working for the company who is supposedly bringing civilization to people from Africa, when the head of this whole thing is crawling through on his hands and knees through the jungle to this kind of devilish type figure that doesn't look too good for civilization right and for what the company's doing so if you wanted to write the anti-colonialism paper this would be another good bit to put in there so he thought about killing uh mr kurtz but then he was worried mr kurtz was going to yell and then that would bring other people okay going on a little bit um <clears throat> on page 124 he talked about Kurtz, Marlowe thinks that Kurtz has gone into insanity, basically. There was nothing either above him or below him, I knew it. He kicked himself loose of the earth, confound the man. He kicked the very earth to pieces. He was alone, and I before him. Okay, now, um, go to page 126. So this is as Marlowe and Kurtz are leaving. Uh, and they carry Mr. Kurtz because he's in very bad health and bring him out to the steamer, and then... There was an eddy and a mass of human bodies, and the woman with the helmeted head, the queen, <clears throat> uh, rushed out to the very brink of the stream. She put out her hands, shouted something, and all that wild mob took up the shout in a roaring chorus of articulated, rapid, breathless utterance. Do you understand this, I asked? Understand this, I asked? He kept on looking at me out past the fiery, longing eyes with a mingled expression of wistfulness and hate. He made no answer, but I saw a smile, a smile of indefinable meaning, appear on his colorless lips the moment I, after I which convulsively, do I not? So, all these people came out and were screaming for him. Marlo looks at Kurtz and goes, do you understand this? Do you understand what they're doing? And he looks at him and says, do I not? Which is a dumb question. I'm not not licking toads, to quote The Simpsons. Anyway, 
going on. So then they start shooting uh, into the jungle, and then the boat is off, right? Now, Kurtz is on his way back to Europe, and at this point he is not doing very well. And Kurtz, on page 129, said, close the, sh- close the shutter, said Mr. Kurtz suddenly one day. I can't bear to look at this. There was a silence. I will bring your heart yet, he cried to the in- invisible wilderness. Now, he gives Marlowe a packet of his papers and, and pamphlets. Uh, he gave me a packet of papers and a photograph, a lot of st- tied together with shoestring. Keep this for me. This noxious fool, meaning the manager is capable of prying into my boxes when I'm not looking. Kurtz gave Marlowe all his secret documents. Right Now, at the end, when Kurtz gets back to Europe, somebody asks him for it, and he refuses to give it to him because he wants to kind of protect Mr. Kurtz's memory. Now, on page 130, Mr. Kurtz dies, and this is one of the awesome parts in the book also. Not awesome that he's dead, but anyway. Um, so, it, there's just one candlelight. The horror, the horror. He cried in a whisper at some image, at some vision. He cried out twice, a cry that was more, more than a breath. The horror, the horror. Now... The horror, the horror, horror, the horror, is a very uh, cryptic and kind of creepy thing to say as your last words. And the way you interpret them kind of affects how you understand the book. The horror, the horror, could be he realizes all the bad stuff he's done and feels bad about it. The horror, the horror, could be that his reputation's going to be destroyed. The horror, the horror, is that he has to leave this place and he wants to stay here forever. The horror, the horror, is he could have gotten more ivory. I don't know. He could have been more vicious. It's kind of up to you. This is another one of those inconclusive experience type things. On page 131, Mr. Kurtz died, right? And then, however, as you see, I did not go to join Kurtz there and then. I did not. I remained to dream the nightmare out to the end to show my loyalty to Mr. Kurtz once more. Now, another one of my absolute favorite sentences in the book is on page 131. Droll life thing is, that mysterious arrangement of merciless logic for a futile purpose, the most you can hope from it is some knowledge of yourself that comes too late a crop of inextinguishable regrets now droll is kind of like dryly humorous so kind of a dry joke life is right a mysterious arrangement of merciless logic logic makes sense right logic thinking logically and thinking critically about things that are using facts but the logic of our lives and life on earth and life for all of us is merciless all of us die all of us get sick and all of us you know it happens right the most you uh for a futile purpose all that logic and all that mercy, lack of mercy for no real purpose. The best you can get out of this is some knowledge of yourself. But that comes at the end, and that's too late. Happy Monday. Hmm. Okay, last couple things. Um, then Marlowe goes back to the city, right? And at first, he is very annoyed with the people he meets. I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to do one last short video for the very end.